good afternoon, everybody, and welcome on what would ordinarily be a perfect beach day in New Jersey. We are here in Trenton, where the governor is expected to uh, have a press conference where he will announce his actions on the budget. Uh, Michael Aaron is with us. I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Michael is our uh, senior political correspondent. Um, they catered the thing, and it's there's like 100 people in here. There are a lot of Murphy supporters in the room, <clears throat> a lot of union reps from the CWA and the NJEA, uh, environmentalists, others. I don't see many legislators except for the, the big legislator, Steve Sweeney, who just wandered into the back of the room to hear what Murphy has to say. I guess that kind of really sums things up, right? I mean, we've talked throughout this past year of how this governor has not been able to line up a solid um, uh, Murphy block, and the absence of many, many or any legislators here is confirmation of it. It is, and yet, if you think back to where we were a year ago today, there was so much acrimony a year ago today when they finally reached a budget deal at about this hour and held a joint press conference. Everything feels calm today. It doesn't feel like Sweeney, who's going to address the press after this, it doesn't feel like he's going to try to tear the governor apart this right. time. I sense more comedy and more... Uh, more equanimity between the, the parties than we had a year ago. To what can we uh, attribute that? Well, I think they're both reading their press notices, yeah. and the press is castigating one or the other or both at the same time for fighting like politicians have never fought before, and... Maybe they're realizing that it doesn't play so well day in and day out. There was a point um, during this process, which at this point now is an annual uh, process, where um, we said, wow, this, um, there really is going to be a shutdown. But then it seemed like the air got let out of the balloon, you know, two, three weeks ago. It did. Uh, the, the whole fight this year was over the millionaire's tax, Murphy wanting it, the legislature not wanting it. Once it was determined on June 20th that the legislature was not going to supply it, it gave both sides a chance to calm down, uh, to, to figure out what they really are going to have in the budget and what they're really not going to have. And it's been a fairly routine 10 days in, at the end of June. Right. Just a programming note, um, the governor is going to be having his press conference and then the uh, Senate president is, says he's going to, quote, have something to say later, and that's going to be in the State House. So what's going to happen is we'll cover all of this, we'll go down um, off the air, and then set up over in the State House, and then resume with the uh, Senate president's statement. So, Michael, uh, we just came um, less than a half hour ago from a briefing. <clears throat> Uh, with the treasurer and administration officials, to the extent that we can say anything about what we heard there, um, what does this document that he's the governor has said he will sign today? What does it represent? A victory? A loss? A draw? Uh, I would say a draw, and I think the most notable thing about this budget is that it doesn't sound like it's going to be full of vindictive line-item vetoes. Uh, with one notable exception, there is a, a veto of $5 million for Cooper University Hospital, where George Norcross is the chairman. That looks punitive. That looks... Uh, right. <coughs> I actually saw a couple of, of, of those things. There was something for Rutgers Camden that was also line item. Uh, yeah, a, a workforce study, $500,000. Yeah. $500, and then um, some money that was put aside for... Uh, school and municipal consolidation, which is right in uh, Steve Sweeney's Path to Progress agenda. That's true. That got the biggest cut of the line items that we've seen so far, cut by from $48 million to, to $10 million. Yeah. So will, will we see Steve Sweeney use some of the kind of language he used at 
time when uh, Christie vetoed a lot of his stuff. I doubt it. Otherwise, I don't think he'd be standing right. 20 feet he from is us. really about 20 feet from us. Yeah. It's kind of odd because you can't expect that these guys agree on this final budget, but the Senate president is back there just kind of haunting this whole thing. Greeting well-wishers yes. and uh, fending off press people by right. saying, I, I'll have something to say when this is over. Yeah. So, the, I mean, this process, right? I mean, as we said, it's a, it's an annual process now, and it's some years really super dramatic, and this year not so much. Not so much. Uh, again, the drama was over the millionaire's tax. Uh, it would have brought in half a billion dollars. The legislature, the assembly's up for election this fall. They don't want to run on a tax hike, albeit one that seems to be pretty popular in the polls. The Senate president has adopted a position that New Jersey is way overtaxed and it's time to look at spending and not taxing. So once that argument was made and settled, they didn't really have that much to fight about other than their personal animosities that creep into almost everything they say these days. Yeah. So, I mean, as we were saying, this room is full of uh, the governor's supporters from uh, unions and uh, nonprofits involved in, in um, social activities and so on. Uh, but it doesn't have any lawmakers here. Going forward, what does that say? I mean, does it say that, I mean, the budget process may be over, but how do they go forward now? Uh, that's do they a, all just take the summer off? Well, no, I don't think these people take too many days right. off. Uh, Murphy is. You, you asked a minute ago, is it a win, a draw, or a loss yeah. for Murphy? He lost the millionaire's tax, but he still, I think, is emerging from this in decent shape. Uh, Sweeney's in decent shape. Coughlin plays in his own yard. He doesn't get involved in the in the vitriol. Right. Uh, I don't know how it'll play out going forward. Will, uh, will Murphy? There's some columns being written this week that there's a new Murphy, a tougher Murphy, a more aggressive Murphy. I don't know if that's just... Have we seen it? I mean, I, I, I don't feel like he can really claim much of a victory out of this other than to say that the majority of this ref, uh, reflects his ideological stance, but it kind of represented all of their ideological stances anyway, right? I think so. I think so. They're not that far apart on... <clears throat> a lo- mo- most of this budget are things the governor proposed three months ago and that the legislature agrees with him on. Right. i got to take a seat for a, a all right. moment. All right? All right. We're going to uh, take a little pause here. Michael Aaron is going to take a, a seat. We are in the... Um, governor's press office and i'll get brendan to maybe take a look around this room so that you can see that there are i don't know several hundred people here who are uh, including the senate president i'm going to try and do something a little crazy and see if the senate president would actually talk to us beforehand folks watching at home uh this could get a little messy considering where we are physically and what i'm about to try to do now which is to get the Senate president to give us a couple minutes. Uh, Brendan, we should be prepared to pivot quickly back to the audience. But once I get through here, I'm going to see if we can get a minute with the Senate president. Mr. President, we're, we're live right now. I thought you could give us a minute. You're going to talk to us later. All right. All right, so that's what, as I expected, the uh, Senate president, um, not in really in the mood to talk. Plus, there are about 20 reporters here who are uh, willing and ready and able to talk to him. So it really wouldn't be fair for him to just talk to us. But I did grab our colleague, John Reitmeyer, who is our numbers guy, to um, talk about what we may, uh, what's in this budget and what's not in this budget. First of all, welcome. Welcome to Sunday in Trenton. Um, so what's the, the highlights here? What, what's the takeaway? From, from this, what's going to happen what we're here? We're waiting on him to announce. Yes. I mean, I, I think um, we'll have to see exactly what makes the final cut and what right. doesn't, uh, how much he uses the line item veto versus he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, now, we had a, a, a briefing just a little while ago, and 
Obviously, most of that is embargoed until the uh, the governor makes his comments here, which we're told is imminent. Um, but I hope we hear him. Yeah. It's a packed room with uh, a lot of extra people. So right, I was saying to Michael Aaron that they catered the thing. I've never seen a budget signing like this. So uh, right, I mean last year interesting way to do it last year at this time when they had this press conference i don't think there were this many people here right i mean it was kind of a yeah we i know the press was in the front row right in front of them but it was all kind of breaking and late at night yeah. so maybe uh this had more time to be planned yeah and, and it's it's interesting in, in my mind how um the governor's kind of playing this as almost like a rally, really, um, and less of a, of a budget sign. Yeah, and I think the key issue is uh, it's mostly his budget, what the legislature sent back to him. So what he's changing is really all within the margins of what his budget was, with one or two or three or four big exceptions, and the biggest one of those is the millionaire's tax. So uh, I've described it as having a body with all of its organs, uh, except for two, my eyeballs. So, <laughs> right. You know, it's mostly the body he sent them, and they sent it back to him, but it's missing. One of the things that's not in it is a very important thing in his eyes to be missing, and that's the millionaire's tax. Yeah, that's a gross analogy of a body with no eyes, <laughs> but thanks for that. <laughs> so does this, in your mind, I mean, you're a budget watcher. Um, does this, in your mind, represent a victory, a loss, or a draw for the governor? Yes. <laughs> it's a victory in the sense that most of what he proposed back in March makes it, right? Including a big pension payment, money for New Jersey Transit, money for K through 12 education. It's a loss in the sense that uh, it doesn't have the millionaire's tax right, or right. some of the other revenue raisers that he wanted. Doesn't have the increased funding for the community college free tuition program that he wanted. Uh, doesn't have a, a couple other items that he wanted. Um, and then I guess, you know, it is sort of a draw on some things because um, we don't know how the budget year is going to play out. And so, um, you know, maybe the surplus, he wanted a bigger surplus than he'll probably get. Yeah. And so um, maybe the year plays out in a way that gives him a bigger surplus. So right. We keep hearing, and they said several times in this budget briefing that they held just about an hour ago, um, about an economic downturn. Um, some have suggested that they're, you know, uh, crying wolf here. Um, what's your sense of the possibility of an economic downturn? I mean, so if I if I could give you that predi that precise <laughs> prediction, I'd be running I to. Mean, what have you been hearing? Oh, here's the governor right here. I'll spare you that one. That's the governor and the um, lieutenant governor. And uh, this seems like anything but a uh, pretty staid budget signing. Uh, this is very much, as we said, a kind of a rally that the governors put together. Um, there are a lot of people here from groups who are, we have to call progressive groups, who are in line with the governor. So let's hear what the governor has to say. Wow, good afternoon. This is quite a room. You've heard me say this before, but as my mother told me, you're known by the company you keep. And I am proud to stand with the people in this room. I'm proud to stand with Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, whose commitment to fairness is without qualification. I'm proud to stand to her left with Treasurer Liz Moyo and her entire team, especially the folks at the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Revenue and Economic Analysis who have worked long days over the past months to help us build a better and more honest budget. I'm proud to stand with my extraordinary staff led by two extraordinary chiefs, George Helmy and Matt Platkin. I am proud to stand with organized labor, Ray. Proud to stand with proud progressives, grassroots and faith leaders, 
and the many other advocates here who represent a profound change in how New Jersey works, and most importantly, for whom it works. You have been some of the strongest, most passionate, and most dedicated leaders for honest change and real reform. But most of all, you have given voice to putting the needs of the people ahead of greed, ahead of the wealthy, and ahead of special interests. It is in that spirit that I ran for governor to build a stronger and fairer state that works for every family and to inspire the absolutely necessary shift where power and organization come from the bottom up. I was just in church with Reverend Taylor, so after that, I've got to say amen. amen. This is the model for how New Jersey moves forward. Before I go on, I want to acknowledge another guy here. Please help me acknowledge Senate President Steve Sweeney. And in the last 18 months, we have come a long way. But I am not naive. Everyone here knows the old ways haven't been put behind us yet. While progressive change is taking hold all across the country, Trenton re remains largely a holdout. Have no doubt, change is coming to Trenton, and I invite all those willing to join us. But for those stuck in the failed ways of the past, we're moving forward. Amen. So this budget makes progress, and at the same time, it also falls short. In a number of consequential ways, this budget is a victory for the values and vision we all share. Spending in this budget is, in fact, very close to that which I first proposed in March. It shares a great deal of the same middle class priorities. It follows my lead on many important initiatives. This budget allows New Jersey to do many good and long overdue things, to make a historic investment in public education, to continue the progress of turning around NJ Transit and to continue making up for years of neglect, to provide more direct property tax relief for the middle class. to make health care in New Jersey more available and more affordable, despite the attacks from Washington. This budget builds on our commitment to a livable wage by supporting those who work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and for hardworking and underpaid child care providers. It builds on our commitment to address our maternal an infant mortality crisis, especially among our communities of color. A righteous cha cause championed by our superb First Lady, Tammy Snyder Murphy. And by the Lieutenant Governor and by many others in our cabinet. The budget maintains the more than $1 billion in real and sustainable savings I outlined in my initial budget including innovative public employee health care savings that our administration negotiated in good faith with our union brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. And by the way, that $1 billion of savings, they remain the only real and sustainable savings in this budget. It follows my obligation to put our public employee pensions on firmer footing. Amen. Amen. And I will work with everyone willing to come to the table with ideas for lessening the property tax burden. But I will not negotiate away the retirement security or the health care of hundreds of thousands of middle class New Jersey families, period. Let me, let me restate, if I may, words of my budget address. I'll quote myself. Our public workers are not the enemy. They are our neighbors. 
They are also our taxpayers. They are the heart of our middle class. It is not pandering to stand with them. It is doing our job. And those, and those who attacked them did not get their way this year. This budget is another down payment on our commitment to the middle class and all those aspiring to get there. It is in many ways a people's budget and the values of our communities are writ large throughout its hundreds of pages. But it undeniably also falls short in some ways. It falls short because we were all elected to tackle the hard problems, not to take the easy way out. And too often this budget takes the easy way out. The people of New Jersey are tired of that, and so am I. I say this humbly. I am standing here today because of that desire for change. I was elected because I offered a different vision for New Jersey and because I don't owe the insiders anything. So I'm in the fight for the long haul. It doesn't end today or tomorrow or next week or next month. And I know the people of New Jersey and all of you here today are just as determined and just as resolved. The simple question that should drive all of our actions is this. Whose side are you on? Everybody down here knows their answer to that question, and I know mine. I'm on the side of putting the needs of New Jersey's families ahead of the wealthy, ahead of priv privileged insiders, and ahead of powerful special interests. But the forces of business as usual are stubborn and strong. They are forces that dictate and demand rather than listen and negotiate. And the people are left out. The proof of that is found in how this budget falls short on the issue of tax fairness. This is, by and large, by the way, the same legislature that voted five times for a millionaire's tax. Five times. They backed up those votes with words like, and I'll quote from the past, this is something we're not going away on. And another quote, I don't believe in the middle class and the working poor being constantly the ones who have to bear the burden. Amen. And this year, with Trump's tax breaks for millionaires, conditions are even more favorable to finally put the millionaire's tax to work for all of New Jersey. Let's start with the obvious. Unlike my predecessor, I will sign a millionaire's tax. Yeah. Amen. New Jersey today has more millionaires than ever, not fewer, and their numbers are growing. And by the way, we want more of them. In fact, we already have more millionaires per capita than any other state in the United States of America. And, and this modest tax, which is, by the way, barely two cents on every dollar of income over a million dollars, will not push them out. In fact, as a result of the Trump tax cuts, those same wealthy people will, after a millionaire's tax, and even after the loss of the SALT deduction, still come out way ahead. Our administration has estimated the millionaire's tax would generate more than $500 million annually. Easy, Barry. A half a billion dollars that would be a recurring, reliable source of revenue to invest in property tax relief, public school funding, and municipal aid. A half a billion dollars, dollars that would strengthen New Jersey against any coming economic downturn. A half a billion dollars that would not 
come out of the pockets of the people already squeezed in our state. The middle class, and like I was growing up, those striving and looking up someday to, hoping to get there. Yet the facts and history were left on the vine and the voices of the vast majority of New Jerseyans who support a millionaire's tax, by the way, on both sides of the aisle, were left in the ether. Instead, the budget that I was sent protects 19,000 millionaires and leaves the other almost 9 million residents to pick up the tab. The legislative leaders refused to give it a fair hearing and refused to put it up for a vote just to deny the people of New Jersey a clear tally of who stands with them and who stands against them. And so I ask you again, whose side are you on? Time, time and again, the status quo forces in Trenton took the wrong side. And for all its good, the budget the legislature sent me still protects opioid manufacturers instead of those suffering with addiction. It still protects big businesses who push their employees onto Medicaid and push the financial burden for their health care onto our shoulders. And it even still sides with the gun lobby over a common sense effort to raise handgun fees for the first time since 1966, over a half a century. These are the revenues that would have allowed us to do more, to tell our community college students that they matter, or to free up more funding for pre-K. These are the bad old habits that temper a lot of the good progress in this budget. They are the habits that jeopardize the future of the good investments this budget will make in the upcoming year. But I remain concerned about our ability to maintain them even in the following year, let alone the next 10 years. And the budget I was sent missed its opportunity to save for the rainy day we all know will come and which many experts are warning us will come. The legislature's plan ignored the statutory obligation to deposit hundreds of millions of dollars into the rainy day fund. To allow that to happen would leave us weaker in the eyes of the bond rating firms and vulnerable to the next economic downturn. When he signed the law creating the rainy day fund in 1991, Governor Florio, to my left I might add, said the following, the rainy day fund gets us off the financial roller coaster a ride that has left us breathless, unable to plan for our future. And then Glo Governor Florio went on, and he said, it's mind-boggling to consider how we became a fiscally precarious state. We spent money we shouldn't have, and then we spent money we didn't have. 28 years later, those words ring as true as ever. The need for us to get off the financial roller coaster is more important than ever. The need for us to save for tomorrow is more important than ever. I will not let this opportunity pass. I am using the full power of my office to protect our fiscal house. We. We will make a more than $400 million deposit into the Rainy Day Fund. In addition, I am directing the head of the Division of Budget and Accounting to hold up to $235 million in appropriations in reserve until savings assumed in this budget materialize or current revenues reliably overperform, or the legislature authorizes new revenues. These actions, making the first deposit into the rainy day fund in a decade, plus placing at-risk line items into reserve, are needed for us to stop the roller coaster and to catch our breath. In addition, I have prudently used my line item veto authority to eliminate $48.5 million in spending. We need to stop spending what we shouldn't have and what we don't have. And that's true, by the way, whether it's in the budget 
or in our system of tax incentives. As I've already said, I will veto the incentives extension that sits on my desk. Sounds like a popular decision, just uh, catching this room. I will not renew a program that drains the funds this budget needs to more directly invest in the people it will work so hard to support, and which, by the way, has not moved the needle on economic growth and job creation in our state. When you finish 42, 47, and 9 out of 50, you're not in the playoffs, never mind champs. And I do not take lightly the prospect of New Jersey going for any period of time without an incentive program. But the expiring programs are so flawed that this actually is the better alternative than continuing a broken and rigged status quo. I am ready to work with the legislature for the long-term success of New Jersey's economy. And I sincerely hope they will join me in seizing this moment. So here we are at the end of another fiscal year, and the story of the good, the bad, and the ugly plays out. But as governor, I am here to lead. To quote Harry Truman, a leader who was never deterred by the odds, and I quote the president, in per periods where there is no leadership, society stands still. Progress occurs when people seize the opportunity to change things for the better. Yeah. Boy, do those words still ring true, eh? That means making difficult choices. It means keeping our eyes on the prize, even as the forces of business as usual seek to needlessly divide us. So to be clear, the legislature and I strongly agree on many essential investments in New Jersey's families, and this budget will make those investments. But we also strongly disagree on who should fund them. As fundamental as that disagreement is, it is not reason enough to walk away from this budget. It is not a reason to shut down state government. It is a reason to continue the fight. It is a reason to continue to ask, whose side are you on? Yeah. New Jersey is not a state of quitters. We keep going no matter the odds. I have signed this budget, but not without deep changes, not without setting funds aside for our future, and not without ensuring that it all adds up. So where some of the legislature use magic math, I've used my full legal authority, including my veto pen. And, and I have met my constitutional obligation of signing a responsibly balanced budget. Despite all the ways this budget and the process that created it fell short, I remain an optimist. It's time to move past small thinking and dream big dreams. It's time to listen to the people of our great state, the people whose dreams this budget will support. I am resolved. We are resolved to make this a stronger and fairer state, a place where every family can succeed, a place where innovators and world-class businesses come to make their future, a place where people can stay to live their dreams and reap the benefits of their hard work. We have made a great deal of progress, and we have more work to do. The work on the fiscal year 2020 budget ends today, but the fight for the middle class and all those working to get there continues. So this is the question, whose side are you on? My answer is yours. Thank you.
Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, Liz, Ed, thank you. Sammy, Barry, Brandon, thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you all. Aliana. I didn't hear you chanting, Kathy. We got a big, bigger crowd than we thought we'd have, so I believe there are press here. I'll take a couple of questions from the press, and hopefully we'll be able to find some opportunity to follow up as well. Nikita, is that you? Yeah. Uh, so you criticized the state house lawmakers a lot this budget season. I'm just wondering, who specifically there would you like to see not brought back into office this year? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. Who specifically would I what? Which Democrats would you like to see? Nikita, I'm good. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> I'm sorry? They put us in front instead of putting us in the yeah, it may, may, may make sense to stand up if you're the right. I can, I can barely see Or to seat the press in the front. So, so, Governor, to follow up with Nikita's point, because you're... you're, you're I honestly you're, didn't hear it, so I apologize. Well, basically he's saying you're, you're trying to strike a tone between being conciliatory, trying to work with the legislature, but you're also, this is, you're also sticking a finger in the eye of the legislature, saying that they're, they're falling short. How, how do you expect to move forward in a cooperative manner uh, with, with these counter... Uh, of here. Listen, I'd say, Matt, too, and again, the kid, I apologize that I literally couldn't hear you, but I want to reiterate something. We got high 90s of what we asked for in this budget that continues the work of last year's budget and all the days both before and in between in rebuilding that blueprint for the middle class. So I am very grateful for that. There are a couple of exceptions that, that I think are huge blunders, including not funding sufficiently community colleges. The Community College Opportunity Grant. Anyone else join me in that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Big mistake. I had deep concerns and problems with the revenues side of this budget, and I think I've been quite clear about the tax fairness, the lack of tax fairness, particularly millionaires, opioid manufacturers, companies that don't have health care for their employees, gun, the gun lobby. Uh, I think I, those, those statements can both hold. Those views can both hold. I would ask further. I continue to have, enter this with, as a person of goodwill trying to find common ground. I promise you that. I think the bigger question we have to ask ourselves is this, whose side are you on? And are the folks who are elected representing the will of the people who elected them? And that, to me, is the fundamental question. And I wake up every morning doing, doing everything I can to do just that. Governor. Michael, I have to defer to you. I can't see who else had their hand up back there, but Michael. budget briefing that we got before your speech, we heard about half a dozen items that you line item vetoed, including $5 million for Cooper University Hospital, where George Norcross is your chairman. Uh, two questions. One, how would you explain to George Norcross canceling out his line item? And secondly, the, 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 the items that you're putting in reserve, we haven't seen what they are yet. Are those other legislative priorities that are getting put into yep. a reserve fund? So on your first question, you won't be surprised. We don't spend a lot of time hanging out, so I'm not sure I'll have an opportunity to, uh, to, to address that question. But as a, as a general matter, we call balls and strikes on this. First of all, it's only $48.5 million. The budget, I think, is $38.7 billion, okay? Uh, and there are, I think, five different, as I recall, five items. Uh, and there's a, there was a formula to determine whether or not was there a program behind the money? Uh, was it improperly calculated? Is it a program that we're already accounting for in a different line item or in a different statutory uh, uh, category? Uh, and I promise you we're calling these things balls and strikes, and we're, we don't care about geography, individuals, or, or companies. I'm sorry? It looks conspicuously political. It, it, it is not, I promise you. And, in fact, this is literally uh, uh, assessed by folks who are, are making these decisions in Treasury and OMB, and they're, and they're calling that based on those parameters I just mentioned. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that. I'm, I prom like an elephant, I remembered the second question. So the, the um, items that, are, that will be held in reserve – Again, a decision by the, uh, by the Treasury, uh, Treasurer and OMB. I w you haven't asked this. My guess is we'll know sooner than later what that list looks like. 
But importantly, it is a list that will include, as I said, up to $235 million of programs, and it will include all shapes and sizes, including items that we have proposed. And importantly, unlike the list of line item vetoes where we can't find the program, we can't find the rationale, the math isn't right, it's being covered elsewhere, the overwhelming amount of the up to 235 are programs we like. So I, I, I want to build a, a basketball hoop in every driveway in the state, but I got to, at the end of the day, the buck stops with me. I've got to certify these revenues. I've got to make sure that we are within our means. So that list is a very different list. It's a list of things overwhelmingly we want to do, but I have to see either, as I mentioned in my remarks, that the expenses that have been presented actually turn out to be real, or secondly, our revenues come in ahead of expectation, or thirdly, the legislature present to us another new revenue source. It's subject to some combination of that. We will do our level best over time, and Liz and her team will oversee this, to, uh, assuming we get some combination of that, we'll try to free those resources up as best we can. Sir. Governor. Oh, it's negative. I didn't see it, man. Yes, that's all right. I'm in the shadow of Michael Aaron, so. <laughs> <laughs> the shadow of your smile. <laughs> you, you last year got half of a millionaire's tax. This year you got 0% of a millionaire's tax. You just spent 25 minutes bashing your partners in the legislature. How are you going to get a millionaire's tax? David, I think I was extremely gracious, at least in half of those 25 minutes. Uh, come on. I, I was, I was, uh, listen, we, David, we got overwhelmingly what we wanted on the investment side. The tax fairness piece, we didn't get uh, the way we wanted it. And let me just tell you, this ain't going to end today. I suspect I speak for everybody up front here with me. This fight goes on. We didn't get here just to get to June 30th and then stumble into July 1st and start this all over again. This is a, we're on a crusade, uh, and some of those crusades took longer than a year and a half. Uh, I'm here to tell you. Legislators here who would be part of a, a Murphy coalition. I'm standing, David, with the people I go to work for every day. These are the people I represent. I represent the people in this room. I can barely see you, but please. Governor, um, you, you spoke in your remarks about the process falling short. How much personal responsibility do you take for there not being a millionaire's tax in this budget, not getting additional community college funding, and other priorities that are not in this budget? So I'm, all, I'm sure I can always do some things better, but when the gap exists as wide as it is between the will of the people and the actions that the legislature took on the revenue side and sent it back to us, I can only take so much responsibility with all due respect. I know whose side I'm on. I don't have to, I don't have to wonder about that every day. Please, one or two, and then I, I can barely see you all, but please. Catherine, is that you? Yeah. Hi. Um, Governor, why did you decide to not meet with um, Senate President Steve Sweeney and someone's conversation? So we presented our, this is not that complicated. We, we presented our budget on March 6th. We got back some sense of where the legislature was going, sort of in general terms on June 14th. We got their budget on June 20th. That's three and a half months of Liz and every one of her, including Sheila, every one of their colleagues doing not one but multiple hearings, multi multiple, many, I don't know, countless, but many principal to principal meetings, team to team, staff to staff. Uh, they ultimately chose to exercise their constitutional responsibility on June 20th. It's June 30th. I'm the governor. I just exercised mine. Daniel. Governor, the tax breaks expire tonight at midnight. You want the caps. Legislative leadership says they don't want the caps. It seems like you're both at an impasse. It just... I don't get it. I don't know how you could support extending this program. You talk about the tax incentives? I, I don't get it. I literally don't get it. So e even if they were run, even if the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts ran them, they finished 42nd, 47th, and 49th in wage growth, job growth, and poverty eradication. It's quite clear there, that, 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 that there was some poor behavior in this. I don't know how you can extend that. I literally don't know how you can extend that. I was hoping up until today that we'd have a, cha a change of, of heart. Uh, but obviously we haven't, and we're going to have to figure out where we go from here. Uh, before I come to you, Brett, all the way in the back, sir, I can't see 
you please address the issue of debt? The last numbers that I saw on the state treasury website is uh, say New Jersey's $34 billion in debt. Is that too much? And is the state spending too much? Uh, is, do we have too much indebtedness? That's not a hard one. I hope you have harder questions. Yes, we do have too much indebtedness. That's what I inherited. We used to be a AAA bond rated state. And across the past two and a half, three decades, you heard Governor Florio in his remarks that I quoted, uh, we've gone adrift. We stopped doing the stuff we used to do really well. Uh, this is a, a surplus that I am presenting in a budget, including the rainy day fund, of almost a billion, 300 million. We will end today with well over a billion, Liz, in our surplus. That'll be the first time in the history of the state we'll have back-to-back -back over a billion dollar surpluses. Brett, can I go to you? Yeah, we're going to shut it down. Yeah, uh, so you have a lot of advocates who are chanting your name. You have a teleprompter. Your speech sounded like a re-election speech. I've not heard your name chanted yet. <laughs> that doesn't happen, so it's okay. But, uh, but, but you're, I hope but, uh, it comes. <laughs> that's, uh, but is this almost like a, a reset, you know, sh shoving, I mean, going forward, like, this is, this is, you see the next two years as being critical to getting your message out there and... I think, Brett, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse or do a Groundhog Day on you again, because I know that that's something you and I have to discuss, which Bill Murray movies we like more than others. But um, I just want to repeat, uh, I am really, with a couple of exceptions, really happy uh, that we got what we got in our budget. We got the overwhelming percentage of our priorities. And to me, that's a huge deal. We didn't get tax fairness. I don't know if it's tomorrow, next month, two years from next month, I don't know, but we're not relenting. I'm not going away. Are we going away? We're not going away. And we're going to stay at it until we get it. I want to thank again the Lieutenant Governor, the Treasurer, our staff, the teams, First Lady. I want to thank the extraordinary advocates, brothers and sisters from organized labor, faith communities, proud progressives, the nine million folks who call this great state their home. Uh, I wish everybody, we're open for business tomorrow. Let's remember that. Tomorrow we're open for business. I'll be back here and I know you will be too. God bless you all. Thank you all. Happy Fourth of July. Hi again, everybody. <laughs> um, as you just saw, the governor wrapping up in what felt very much like a pep rally or um, a launch of a re-election campaign, uh, defending his budget priorities. And he obviously line item some um, line item vetoed some items today. Uh, we're going to have much more on that. What's going to happen now is we're going to shut down this part of the program. We're going to set up in the state house probably within the next 25, 30 minutes, where we will hear a response from at least the Senate president. We don't know if anybody else is going to be joining him. But so that's what we're going to do. We're going to shut down now. We're going to come back the next time you see us. We'll be in the State House. We'll have Michael Aaron with us. We'll have Brianna Venosi with us. And we'll have John Reitmeyer with us to give you some more um, specifics and some more analysis. In the meantime, I'm David Cruz for all of us at NJTV News. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in about 30 minutes or so. Thanks.